Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this beautiful event here in uh, the Metropolitan Pavilion. My name is Holly Peterson, and I'm really graced to be with these two beautiful women today to share their story and a little bit about body and identity. So first, I'm going to introduce to you our um, remote guest, who is Helen Joyce. Helen Joyce is in Cambridge, England right now. Um, she's the author of Trans, which is a book um, published in 2021. And in 2005, she joined The Economist, where she works presently. Um, she's their British editor, but she's also been their editor in Sao Paulo, Brazil, an international editor, finance editor, executive editor for events, etc. Previously, she's also published an, um, a journal called PLUS for the University of Cambridge and was the founding editor of the Royal Statistical Society's magazine, Significance. So as I said, Helen joins us from Cambridge, where she resides with her husband and two children. And I also have here Abigail Favela. Abigail, you got fans out there, Abigail. <laughs> Abigail is the Dean of Humanities with, at George Fox University, where she also teaches seminar in theology, philosophy, and literature. Her award-winning writing has appeared in The Atlantic, First Things, Church Life, and other literary and academic journals. Her memoir, Into the Deep, for Cell, Outside, um, was published in 2018. Her academic background is in both feminist and gender theory, and her latest book, The Genesis of Gender, A Christian Theory, will be released by Ignatius Press in about a month or so. Abigail lives in Oregon with her husband and four children. So welcome to both of our guests today. So first question um, is for you, Abigail. So let's just start off with some very basic information about what we're gonna be discussing this afternoon. So gender theory, can you help us understand what it is, a bit about the history of gender theory, and can we also help us understand what is meant when we say sex and when we say gender? All right, well, that's not a simple question, right? What is gender? I think that's the question of the moment. And it's difficult to answer because depending on who you ask and maybe what time of day you ask, you'll get different answers. Um, so there are a lot of different definitions of gender that are on offer right now. And so one of the difficulties of talking about this tricky topic is that people will be using the, the words sex and gender but meaning very different things and sometimes even mutually exclusive things by them. So uh, what might be helpful would be to give just like a quick and dirty historical overview of how the concept of gender developed in the 20th century. So I'll hit some of the highlights or lowlights, depending on how you look at it. Um, and then we'll see if that, I'm, a I'm afraid I'll probably add to the confusion, but I think we just have to wade into it. Okay. So I'll start with uh, feminist philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, who wrote um, the Second Sex, which was published in 1949. And the most famous line from that, from that book is, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman, right? And so that, that statement really is the, the seed of gender theory. And what Simone de Beauvoir is saying in that um, statement is she's making a distinction between woman and female. So she's saying there is this biological facticity of femaleness, but then there are all kinds of social and cultural interpretations of what human femaleness should look like that are layered onto it and that she, she calls woman. So what's interesting, however, is that she doesn't use the, the word gender. You'll notice it's called the second sex. It's not called the second gender. And that's because the word gender was not used in this context yet. And it did not enter the scene until um, John Money, psychologist John Money, began using it in the, the 1950s. Um, and he was the, the first person to coin the term gender role, for example, which has now become so common. Um, and he had a theory of, of pretty extreme social constructionism. So he thought that there's biological sex, but then gender or one's social role and um, that the social expressions and role of one's sex were completely socially constructed and socially shaped and completely malleable, at least in the first three year, years of life or so. 
And he was the first one to really introduce this idea of gender as something distinct from sex. And he had the, unfortunately, he actually had the opportunity to, to test his theory um, on two twin boys, one of whom was um, had a botched circumcision as an infant, and so his, his genitalia was basically um, obliterated. And so his parents brought the twins to John Money to say, well, what do we do? And he's like, don't worry about it. You know, sex really doesn't matter. Um, we'll just kind of, you know, shape this kid up, raise him as a girl, it'll be fine. He won't even know the difference because gender identity is, is a complete construct. So um, this experiment failed pretty catastrophically. So um, the boy eventually rejected his imposed identity as Brenda um, and then tried to, to eke out a normal life as an adult before he, he killed himself in 2004, actually two years after his twin brother as well committed suicide. So both subjects in this, in this experiment um, died. But unfortunately, it, that tragedy took decades to play out. So in the interim, and especially in the first decade or so, um, af as he began this experiment, he was publishing widely a, about gender being this success. And so the concept of gender then took hold in the humanities and social sciences, and feminist theory particularly. So it comes from money, and then second wave feminists take this concept of gender as a way of critiquing the ways in which um, women have been, or that womanhood has been expressed culturally and socially, right? So that's when you get the classic second wave feminist split between sex and gender. Sex is biology, and then gender as, again, the kind of cultural and social meanings imposed on biology. So the next important part of the story would be um, Judith Butler, who, who begins writing in the, in the 1980s. And it's, it's difficult to overestimate the influence of, of Butler's theories in this, con in this discussion about gender. So we already had this idea, very common, very taken kind of as dogma, that you have sex and then you have gender. So gender is a social construct, sex is biological. Well, Butler was the first person to actually come out and say, well, yes, gender is a social construct, and sex is too, right? So Butler's coming from a, a perspective of anti-realist postmodern philosophy, right? So she, her work is heavily influenced by um, Foucault, Michel Foucault. So for Butler, there is no such thing as reality. Any, t any truth claims we make, anything we describe as real, is ultimately um, not only a construct, but it's a, it's, a, it's a social power move, right? So any categorizations that we make, anything that we say is real, any claims of knowledge, those are ultimately exercises of power. And for, for Butler, her whole goal as a theorist was not to reassert some other version of the real, but to question the idea of the real itself and to be just this perennial gadfly, um, to basically poke at categories, reveal exceptions, and just kind of dismantle norms and categories. And so then from the influence of her work is where I think we began to get this latest iteration of what gender is, even though I think it actually contradicts what but Lyrian philosophy looks like, because now um, we're in a cultural moment where the, the reality of sex is denied, like sex is kind of seen as a construct, right? But then gender has become almost this sex of the soul or the psyche um, that, that is asserted as something real, right? So that gives you a little bit of a sense of, of kind of a, how the concept of gender has changed over time, and also how relatively young a history that it has, you know, this, this word and this idea. But I think because it's not attached to any kind of material reality, it's like this, it's like this postmodern juggernaut that can really take on almost any kind of meaning that you want to ascribe to it. We'll come back to the question of what reality and what is real and what is not real in this question, but I wanted to ask you one more before I um, go to Helen. And that is this, you mentioned um, in one of your talks that there's a reification happening today, and um, you define that as a sense of making real something that's not real. So yeah. in this issue, what does that look like? Okay, so that's, yes. So that's actually kind of what I was just describing in a way. So 
We get this idea that gender and sex are both social constructs, that they aren't real from Judith Butler, from philosophy that's very anti-realist at its foundation. But the problem is, like, human beings don't think that way, right? I mean, that's what this whole encounter is about, like the urge for truth. Like, human beings are always going to reach for what is real. They're going to reach for what is true. And so I think the way that Butler's theories have trickled down through the academy and through the education system, through pop culture, social media, you have now, um, I think, especially a lot of young people who are kind of seizing on to the freedom that this idea of sex and gender being a social construct, like that's pretty freeing, but then there's this pivot that happens, and then the new categories of what sex and gender are are very much asserted as real, you know? So I think if you, you know, say the, the average teenager who's you know, coming out as trans, like, they're probably not thinking there is no such thing as reality, and so I can play with all these categories. Like, they, they are seizing onto this concept in order to express something that they believe to be very real. So I think that's what I mean by this, this reification turn that I think is happening on that level, but I think there's also a way in which activists are um, aware of the fact that they're making linguistic assertions in order to reshape our understanding of reality. So they're, they're maybe a little more consciously doing kind of the Butlerian thing. Um, but so I think both of those things are then making or reifying, making real what is, what is fundamentally based on a denial of reality. Thank you. Yeah. So Helen, um, welcome Helen. And I want to ask you more or less the same question. If um, you've often noted in your writing that there is a huge detachment of language from reality. So when you think about this and reification as, as Helen, or sorry, as Abigail just said, wh what do you have to say on that topic more than she's already said? I thought it was an absolutely fascinating, uh, incredibly um, brief but comprehensive trot through uh, <laughs> an ex incredible history. I suppose the things that I'd pick out were, are that um, I, would, I would say more about the distinction between what's happening in universities and what's happening in schools and on Tumblr and on social media. It's exactly as Abigail said that what's feeding through into the popular culture isn't this rather sophisticated, I mean, in my opinion, completely fallacious, but at least it's sophisticated theory about everything being socially constructed and gender is, I think, a... Um, an imitation without an original was what Judith Butler said. So yeah. it's entirely this self-perpetuating thing that didn't start anywhere and that we can shape and we can play with. And I mean, why bother, I want to ask, but at least that's a sophisticated sort of thought. But what's happening on Tumblr or in schools is people are saying you have something like a sexed soul. And that sexed soul is real, but your body is what I've heard called meat Lego. It's a thing that you can chop bits off, you can sew other bits on, you can change it. Um, you are something like um, a homunculus living behind the eyes of some meat robot. And, and the real thing is the thing in here. And unfortunately, we feed this by the way that we have moved into a very virtual world. I mean, in some ways, it's great. Here I am in Cambridge, England, chatting to you lovely ladies, and I wish I was with you. But since I can't be, at least this is second best. But then the kids are sitting in front of screens all the time and they're changing their avatars and, you know, playing with being male, female, as you know, an animal and, you know, 10 foot tall, two foot tall, whatever. And that feels real to them. It feels real to all of us increasingly. So they're forgetting what their bodies are and the fact that they were they were created. They were, you know, born. They were they were inside their mothers for nine months and and then brought into the world and that they will live and they will die and they will live in only one body this is the only one body that they have and that body has been completely sidelined it's been turned into words and that is about power because the belief the postmodern belief the postmodern turn as they call it is that words create reality mm -hmm. and of course words do to some extent create reality when you say i the wed you turn two people into a legal couple you've just performed words that have created some reality but there's something bedrock beneath the words that we use. But that's been erased and now the words are everything. The words create reality and that's a power play. So you must alter the words if you want to alter reality. And then the final thing I'd say about that is people may wonder why the viciousness and the vitriol that is poured upon anyone who disagrees with the modern way of looking at things. And it's because the words make reality. Mm -hmm. So when you yeah. silence people, 
you are stopping them from doing the only harm that's possible, namely by naming what they see and bringing into existence a reality that the activists don't want to see. And so it's an extraordinary maneuver. It's taken some decades, but we've arrived at an, a really strange place where words are real, bodies aren't real, um, where you know words are violence, but actual violence is just standing up for oppression or the oppressed people. It, it's, it's, it's just surreal. Yeah, thank you. On that same note, I wanted to... Go ahead. <laughs> You begin in the book Trans, you begin by saying this is a book about an idea, one that is simple but has far-reaching consequences. So my question for you, Helen, is this a cultural phenomenon we're entering into? I mean, I see it as an American um, movement that's something like a neo-religion. Um, you know, it's maybe not apparent to people in America how much this is something that's come out of American campuses in particular. And it's been exported around the world and it arrives at places that are culturally closest to America first. So here in Britain, uh, we're experiencing it in Canada. They are Australia, New Zealand, much less so on continental Europe, hardly anywhere, anywhere else. Um, it's the idea is the sort of seemingly simple idea that what makes you a man or a woman or indeed a boy or a girl is what you say you are it's what you say you feel and what you state that you feel it's not your body it's not that you were conceived male or female and you grew up it's that you you feel like you're a woman or a man and you say that so you bring that reality into existence by words and this seems minor because most people who think about it superficially assume that only a few people will do that, those people that we call trans. But they miss the fact that it's a statement about all of our realities, that every one of us is male or female or man or woman solely because of what we feel and what we say, that what makes the three of us women is that we say we're women. Well, why would we say we're women? Presumably because we feel like we're women, but we've denied that there's anything real about being a woman. So what is it that makes us Women, we feel feminine, womanly. I mean, am I sitting here talking to you in a womanly fashion? I don't know. And was I womanly when I was painting a door earlier today? Was I womanly when I was getting a maths PhD? You know, you don't know. So it's just detached. It's detached our identities from any referent in our physical selves or indeed in our social selves, not even our social selves anymore. It's not even that I'm being feminine, I'm acting feminine in the way that Judith Butler talked about. It's just what I say. And this has profound consequences, so profound that I took a whole book to talk about them, and it's not the only book talking about them, and Abigail will say many more things about them. Thank you. So this is a question for both of you, and I think you've already led us in that direction, but you both note that there is there are far-reaching consequences to this topic. Um, this is not a topic that's a personal topic, which it's often considered a personal issue, how I identify myself. And it doesn't belong on the stage, certainly doesn't belong in the public square. Um, and I've had people even in this room tell me, why are we talking about this issue? It's a very personal issue. So my question for both of you would be, um, you both mentioned that there are political, legislative, social implications of this issue today. So why should, I guess my first question is, why should we be talking about this in a room full of people? And uh, if it is a personal issue, and what are some of the ramifications of this issue on those topics I mentioned? So do you want to start with it, start first, Helen? Sure, sure. Um, People don't think about this so much anymore because we don't distinguish between men and women in ordinary everyday life the way that we used to. I mean, it used to be that women couldn't vote and men could, or that men could um, get mortgages and women couldn't. But nowadays, all those unnecessary distinctions have vanished. And what we're left with is not that many distinctions between men and women. But where there are distinctions, it's because of our sex. We separate the sports. We separate sporting competitions for men and women because men and women's bodies are different. We have separate changing rooms, separate domestic um, violence refuges, separate rape, rape crisis centers, separate toilets, because both male and female people are more comfortable, more dignified in separate facilities. And in the case of women, safer, because most violence and indeed almost all sexual violence is committed by males. And women are overwhelmingly victims of the sexual violence in particular. So we don't distinguish between men and women except where we really have to and it's sex. So if you 
if you dissolve the idea of what sex is and you replace it by something else, well, then you change the reason why you separate the two sexes in those sorts of circumstances. And it's not about sex anymore. It's about what people say they are. And then you realize that impacts on other people as well. So in the book, I say that gender, gender self-identification is a misnomer. It's actually a demand that other people identify you as the gender that you say you are. So that when I go into a changing room where I expect to only see female people, I might now see male people as well because those male people say that they're female. So that impacts upon me. So that's just one example. I'm sure Abigail would like to add more. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a really good point. So that the sex segregated spaces that still ex exist in our society are related to concrete material conditions that differ between the sexes and primarily to the benefit of women, right? So women's changing rooms are separated not because, you know, women are a particular threat to men, but because vice versa. Um, and I think in, in all these spheres, the one that concerns me the most is prisons. Um, because the argument here is not that, oh, trans people are predatory. Rather, you know, you'll have some bad actors in prison, and if we create a very gameable system where basically, say, a male sex offender can simply tick a box on a form and then be transferred to an all-female facility, um, presume, you know, and this is, a, he might not have to have any sort of physical transition whatsoever because he can he can identify simply by this this statement of language and so and the the women then who are in prison with him it's not like they can just leave right so the the prison situation does concern me quite a bit because that's a very vulnerable population and that's a very gameable system um, I'll also say that one thing I'm I'm increasingly concerned about is the uh, medicalization of gender nonconforming children um, because I think that I think one of the beautiful things about humanity um, is that we're unique individuals I mean each person is a completely unique instantiation of being human right and we're talking about sex differences here but of course there's also a common humanity right and then there's also individual differences so there's kind of these three layers of differences that I think all need to be part of the picture of when we talk about human identity and and I think that because gender and sex differences are are here's my scientific way of expressing a, like bimodal graph, you know, they're kind of like these intersecting humps, basically, right? So you will have individuals here in the middle, um, so men and women who who are maybe, you know, like women whose femininity is more analogous to a typical masculinity and that kind of thing. Um, but what's happening now, because gender is no longer rooted in the body, the only real ground for gender now is in stereotypes. Right? So there's this kind of regressive irony that's happening that a lot of the, the stereotypes that we've kind of progressed beyond are now once again being made real or being reified, right? So now children are, you know, a, a, let's say a, a girl who's a, a tomboy and who loves rough and tumble play, loves to play sports, hates girly things, you know, no longer is she, is she just sort of like, okay, yeah, sure, that's great. Yeah, just be yourself. Now, like, She's, she's invited to question her very identity, like, oh, you must really be a boy, right? Or a boy who loves art and my little ponies. He's, you know, he's now under scrutiny, like maybe he's really a girl. And identity in childhood and adolescence is still so fluid. I mean, that's, that's something that, um, what's the priest who started CL, I'm just learning about this this Father weekend. Father Giussani. Thank you. <laughs> that's something that Father Giussani writes about, right? Like, hey, there's something that's so exciting about adolescence because everything's so intense and everything's so passionate and everything's so full of possibility and people, young people are discovering who they are, right? But now we're in a cultural moment where young people are being put on, um, put on this road to a lifetime of medicalization and basically all kinds of different experiences, different kinds of, um, of, of suffering or anguish that young people are experiencing. It's kind of being stamped with a very a simple framework, like, oh, you must be trans, and here's the way you solve it. You scapegoat your body. Um, we'll, we'll stop your puberty. We'll put you on um, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, and then when you're a little older, 
Um, you know, we can amputate your breasts and then you'll be happy. And I think the, the quickness and enthusiasm with, with which this way of, of treating um, people, this kind of, of therapy or what, what I see is really self-harm kind of repackaged as self-care, I think it's very disconcerting uh, because um, young people are being allowed to make irreversible decisions that they end up sterile, for example. Um, and then when, you know, let's say if they change their mind later, then sometimes that's, that's impossible to do. And I worry about how much money can be made by this. Because if you, if you commit to um, a medical transition, then you know you you are you know you need to be on say cross sex hormones for life, and there are of course physical very s serious physical consequences and risks of that that no one's really articulating I think and no one's really talking about, um, and that to me I think is the the thing that I get the most worked up about. So I want to ask a question a little bit about, I mean, just to, to, I guess, play devil's advocate. So there are many people today, scientists included, who say that sex is a spectrum, right? Or that um, gender dysphoria is a real thing because of spe sex being a spectrum, or the non-binomial that, you know, I'm not one or the other, et cetera, or people being born asexed, right? So can the help, two of you help us understand, um, first of all, where this fits into the question of gender theory. I guess that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to start, Helen? Shall I start? Yeah, yeah. sure. Thanks. So the, the sex as a spectrum idea is old too, and it runs historically along the same track as the track that Abigail talked about. And it, it dates back to about the 1920s and 1930s, and um, maybe even a little earlier. And the idea was that it was actually gay people were somewhere on the spectrum. The idea was that if you were gay, you were a man's brain in a woman's body or a woman's brain in a man's body, and you were somewhere on the sex spectrum. And then when they started to think about people actually being members of the opposite sex, despite what their bodies looked like, they sort of cannibalized this, this idea, this quite false idea. Uh, and, and reused it, repurposed it. One of the things you notice when you start digging around in the history of, the, of gender identity and of trans ideas is what a cannibalistic um, or magpie movement it is. Like it picks up ideas from, from race, from um, about sexuality, all sorts of things like that. And it mixes them all up along with things that it's borrowed from other cultures like um, the Fafafine of Samoa or the Mushe of Oaxaca or whatever. And, and they don't tend to sit together terribly well. So if you, if you think that sex isn't real, then what are you thinking sex is a spectrum for? You know, these, these things don't sit together. Like if sex doesn't exist, well, it isn't a spectrum anyway. I mean, so anyway, no, sexes are not spectrums. We are one sex or the other and intersex conditions as they're called are not actually a disproof of that. Intersex is a rather old fashioned umbrella term for about 40 conditions that are developmental uh, disorders or differences of development of the, set of the gonads and genitalia. And they happen to male people or female people. Yeah. They don't, they don't make you something in between. Mm -hmm. And most people who have a DSD, as they're now known, are clearly recognisable as either male or female at birth. A few of them have some ambiguity of the genitalia and have to be investigated further by the doctor. And in the end, the doctor will diagnose the specific DSD that this child has mm -hmm. and say whether it's a boy or a girl and what treatment this child needs. Because mm -hmm. some of these conditions are very serious. They can be life-threatening. Right. So this is just a... It's just a bit of obfuscation. I don't know if you've ever heard of a gish gallop. It's a debating technique where it was named after a particular person whose surname was Gish, where you just throw all sorts of unrelated facts in very quick succession at the person you're debating, and there's no time for them to you know, respond to each individually. And while they do that, they're missing the thread of what you're actually saying. So these things like intersex people and sex as a spectrum and all that stuff, it's just obfuscation. We all know that we all come in two flavors, male and female. We all know that. We all know that what well, you can tell when you meet people. You can tell it by looking at their face. You can tell it by looking at their general body shape. Um, so yeah, it's just, we all know that's nonsense. It's odd to me that such nonsense has managed to get such wide traction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would echo that and say that 
Um, so DSDs or intersex conditions are best understood as variations within maleness and females, nails, not as exemptions from the reality of sex. Um, so I think that's really important. And in fact, I think the way that certain activists have tried to use the existence of these kind of conditions um, as a way to uproot the reality of sex um, does a lot of disservice to people who are born with these conditions. Because um, I, I never hear intersex conditions brought up in a discussion except to serve as some kind of validation for the idea of the sex binary not being real. It's not really a discussion about, okay, well, what, what uniquely do intersex people need and how can we talk about that in a robust way? And in fact, there are, there are really meaningful differences in the history of intersex activism versus trans activism because one of the, one of the values um, that has been affirmed in intersex activism has been bodily integrity and actually you know, stopping and changing the, the medical approach of, of performing unnecessary cosmetic surgeries on infants who are born with ambiguous genitalia. And so that's actually a, a tension I see between these two movements. So I really think conflating the two is not helpful. It's obvious gaining, like, like Helen said, but I also think it's really dehumanizing to people who have um, variations in sexual development. Okay, thank you. So the next question is for you, Abigail. Um, as a Christian, which you have said in many public settings, you have a per particular view of the person. And being as a Catholic, um, you obviously have, you know, probably have a view of it very similar to that which the Catholic Church says, that body and soul are connected. So the present concept of gender has, for the most part, driven a wedge between, you know, body and soul. So again, can you explain what that wedge would be? and maybe help us understand the implications of that. Sure. Yeah, I think especially coming at this, at this topic from a Christian perspective, especially a Catholic Christian perspective, I mean, Christianity is very much uh, a system of seeing the world and all that is that um, affirms the dignity of the body, the dignity and the goodness of the body. If that's not true, if a Christian understanding of anthropology of a human being as a unity of body and soul isn't true, then all of the central mysteries of Christianity make no sense. The incarnation doesn't make any sense. The resurrection doesn't make any sense. The ascension doesn't make any Like, why would Jesus take a body back up to heaven if it's just his meat Lego suit or whatever, mm -hmm. right? It just doesn't make any sense. Like, why would God even become a body to unite himself with our nature in order to, to um, be able to have communion with us so we could have communion with the divine, right? I mean, all of that... Christianity is so deeply incarnational. Um, so I do think that, that this, I think that this, a framework has emerged for explaining a range of different experiences. And the people who get caught up in this framework deserve our compassion and attention and respect. But I think it's very important that we, that we really take a good look at the framework and realize that what's being offered here is a radically different vision of reality, of the human person, of freedom, of the body, um, than, than the, the Christian understanding of reality. And I think there's a, there's a spiritual dimension here, um, and that's the sacramentality of the body. So in the Christian understanding, sex doesn't matter just because of its, its connection to procreation you know, in an earthly sense. But there's a way in which, you know, every body has a sacramental function. The body reveals the person, right? And I actually think that one of the desires that you can see that's good, that's, that I think is expressed by people who identify as trans, is a desire for their body to express their person, right? Like, that's a good desire. And I think that's something that, that we can pay attention to. But the problem is there's, there's a a lie or a deception about you don't, your body doesn't already reveal your personhood, rather your body is a project, you have to kind of complete it in a, some way or change it in some way in order for it to reveal your personhood. So there's this, this distortion of the sacramentality of the body. Um, but if we, if, we lose, if we lose sight of, of the importance of the body, I think particularly from a Christian perspective, then, then that creates a lot of... Um, that creates a lot of very real problems, not just philosophical and theological problems, but problems that then, you know, um, have to do with how we live and be in the world. So 
yeah, I'm going to step back just a little bit. It's a question I've been wanting to ask both of you, and Don, I'll just ask it here on the stage, and that is this theory of gender and sex, um, gender theory. It just seems like it came out of nowhere, right? I'm an educator. Um, I work in a school. I have somebody coming from a public school into my school saying, hey, I want, want my kid to get into your school because, you know, she's in fourth grade. She's nine years old. She's learning that she needs to either be gay, lesbian, or bi. This is the curriculum's changed in the school next door to my school. I mean, it seems like this came out of nowhere. Ten years ago, I didn't even know what gender was, right? And now it's become, you know, the thing that's driving people away in many, in many cases from the public school. So I guess... My question to both of you, um, it seems troublesome to ask, where did this come from today? Like, like you're almost a bigot if you ask the question, wow, this is, this is, a, very con this is a difficult topic to stop, talk about, so we don't talk about it. So can both of you kind of address that? First of all, you did do a good job of explaining the history, but can you help us understand, like, we're in front of this very challenging situation and no one wants to talk about it? Myself included, until I read your book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, shall I start with a bit of it, which is the um, where it came from? Um, and I think a little bit about why no one wants to talk about it, too. So I think it, it's been a fringe movement for decades. Mm -hmm. That's been there. But it's been something that was only in gender clinics and so on. And then when various activist groups, which had worked their way through various other activist purposes so you know um women got the vote um the civil the civil rights act uh, ended jim crow laws and then we got gay marriage in the 2010s and this pattern was seen very much around the world a lot of groups needed a next cause and that idea that trans was the next cause really fitted in so neatly the next oppressed group that needed our attention and in some ways, that's a good impulse. But then on the other hand, it was also activists looking for a way not to have to disband and to keep very large and very well-funded um, charities and NGOs running. So I think that that's one of the reasons that it sort of launched onto the public consciousness. It was there, but it, it fitted into a place that we had in our society for um, oppression narratives, for um, liberation narratives for a way of thinking about people that was already popular as identities, you know, male, female, what race you are, what ethnicity you are, what sexuality you are, and now another aspect of your personality. And why are we not meant to talk about it? Well, that's so interesting, isn't it? I think partly it's because it's such a mess of a theory that if you're allowed to talk about it, it all falls apart. So they have to try to stop you from talking about it. But it's also this thing that it's a very linguistic movement and language is power. Language creates reality. So if you're allowed to talk about it, you are actually altering reality in ways that the activists don't want you to. So in silencing you, they are carrying out a very good act in their eyes. I would add too that there's, um, so since about well, maybe around 2014 or so, there's been just an exponential rise in the number, especially of, of young people who are, or people who present to gender clinics for wanting transition. So classically, it was a very, very small number um, in the population would, would seek transition. And it was almost always men, and almost always men in middle age, right? But then two huge shifts happened in um, starting about, I don't know, eight, eight 10 years ago. And the, the demographic shifts in two ways. One, it shifted to more women presenting, and then the age shifted way down. And we're talking about like 2,000 increase, 2,000% 2, increase, like just exponentially rose. Um, the you know, gender clinics were flooded, and so new gender clinics began popping up all over the United States. Now Planned Parenthood offers, you know, uh, like gender affirming, I think that's what they call like giving you cross-sex hormones. And so yeah, I could just walk into a Planned Parenthood clinic today, tell them, you know, I think I'm trans and walk out with um, a prescription for testosterone immediately without any kind of assessment by a doctor. Even if I said, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm suicidal, I have an eating disorder, I struggle with depression, it wouldn't matter. Like, I would still, I would still get to walk out. So I think, I think that 
the immersive online digitization, especially of youth culture, has played a huge part in this for reasons that Helen mentioned. And then I also think people saw how much money could be made, again, from medicalizing healthy people for life. Um, and so I think those, those things are feeding into it, um, but there, there really is kind of a, a social contagion element, I think, that's, that's happening. Thank you. Thank you both, yeah. So I have one last question for the two of you, which I think is going to take a bit to flesh out, but um, we have a lot of parents in this room. We have a lot of educators in this room, a lot of um, doctors in this room, and teenagers. And so considering what both of you have learned in your studies, um, neither one of you took this on as a topic of choice. You bumped into it through your work at, you know, at, at The Economist and through your work at the university, et cetera. So what kind of advice would you give to parents and educators to respond to a son, a daughter, a friend, a patient who says they have, who has gender dysphoria or who wants to transition? Um, yeah, how can you help us understand how best to help friends and loved ones to, yeah, deal with their struggle with their given sex? Do you want to go ahead and start, Helen? Sure. I mean, it's a huge question, and I don't like to give the impression that I could swan into somebody's house and in three minutes sort out what is obviously not that simple. But the first thing I'd say, I think Abigail said this, that um, everything gets turned into being about trans now. So one of the things about those teenage gender uh, clinics is uh, that the teenagers turning up at gender clinics is that they're very, very heavily overrepresented um, children on the autistic spectrum, uh, children who are self-harming, um, depressed or anxious children. Uh, these kids often are trying both to express their bodily dis-ease through the medium of gender, through a trans identity, but also they're looking for a panacea because it's sold that yeah. way. Yeah. I talked when I wrote my book, um, the girl who I talked to, a detransitioner, because these are becoming more common sadly now. Um, and she said that she had been so ill with an eating disorder that she was hospitalized for the sake of saving her life. And when she was 18, she searched online to see if it was possible to get somebody to remove your breasts without you having um, cancer. And she discovered trans, um, chat boards and a week later she believed that she was a man but the gender clinic said to her that the reason you have an eating disorder is that you were meant to be a man so your curves are making you uncomfortable if you get a mastectomy and you take testosterone and you go through transition your eating disorder will go and her parents believed them because you believe medical professionals um, so she had a hysterectomy she had her ovaries removed um, she took testosterone by the time she was 21 she was sterile she still had an eating disorder and at 23 she re-identified as a woman so children are looking for a solution to every problem they have and they're told that identifying as trans will solve all their problems mm -hmm. and they will probably have researched online for months before they come out to their parents as trans so they produce what's called the script they will tell you a whole pages long thing that they will have rehearsed and they will have been coached possibly to do it online. Um, they will be primed to think that you're a bigot if you don't immediately go, wow, that's amazing, fantastic. I'm delighted that you're going to medicalize your beautiful body that I carried for nine months within me and gave birth to and fed and have minded up till now. So they're prepared to hear what you say very negatively and so that was a very long preamble to saying, you've got to stay calm. You've got to bring your parenting A game here. And mm -hmm. you've got to say, oh, tell me more, you know, mm -hmm. slow it all down, be very low key, and then explore what it is the child is trying to achieve, what they're trying to express with this identification. And then if you want to be listened to, you have to listen yourself. There's no point in just telling your child that this is stupid or that don't be ridiculous, you're really a girl. Um, there's no point either in pulling out a book like mine and handing it to your child and saying, read that and that'll set you straight. I mean, I wish that would work, that'd be great. You have to listen. You have to say, tell me, tell me what you think. Tell me why you're doing this, help me to understand. And then you can hope that you will be listened to in return. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's that's absolutely right. I think. 
like I mentioned before, you know, pe people who who seek out this kind of, of a very serious change that comes with a lot of risk. You know, no one who feels sort of at peace and content in their life and with themselves is going to seek this out. So there is some kind of anguish or suffering. There's some kind of desire for something that's driving it. And it could be a number of things, right? I mean, we could be talking about, um, you know, I mean, in some, in some, for some instances, it could be someone who's had pretty severe gender dysphoria since they were a child, right? And that, um, and then for someone else, it could be, you know, an autistic kid who never feels like she's fit in. She's, she's a little more interested in, you know, computer science than, than what the other girls like. And so she just assumes she must not really be a girl. You know, there could be a desire for community, a desire for wholeness, right? So I think, I think probably there's some kind of really good desires that are operating underneath it as well as some profound suffering. So I think, I think being patient and being curious and being calm um, and being committed to this kind of ongoing process of discernment and preserving the relationship. I mean, I think, I think hopefully that would go without saying, but you know, definitely don't you know, lay down an ultimatum or, or say, you know, well, if, if you do this, you know, then I'm gonna cut you off and that kind of thing. Like, I think, I think that would be the, the worst possible thing to do. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll also uh, speak from kind of a Catholic perspective about, okay, well, what do we do maybe in our, our parishes or in our schools or in our universities, right? As how do we respond as Catholics? Um, I think in America, I feel fairly pessimistic, I'll be honest, about how this is gonna play out in America. I think, I think Europe will be okay. I think Finland, and <laughs> Finland will be okay. Finland and Sweden have already started. Yeah, I don't, there's like one Finnish guy out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I say that because I, you know, I, the, like Sweden and, and Finland are already very much rolling back on, on especially childhood um, transition and you know, there's some real amazing pushback happening in the UK, which Helen is a big part of, but the US is a mess. The US is a mess. Um, I worry about a lot of things. I worry about how politicized this is, how polarized our culture is, and now this has just become another kind of sign to plant in your yard, another bumper sticker to put on your car, another way of kind of affiliating with your tribe. Um, and then, of course, once, you're, once you've taken the party line, you know, you just kind of immerse yourself in the echo chamber and. I worry too about the, the way that we have a decentralized and profit-driven healthcare system. Um, I just think there's a lot, of, a lot of not so great things about American society that are letting this thing run amok. But here's maybe one piece of hope, and that is that America also has this, it's like kind of a freakishly religious place. <laughs> um, and there's, there's this value of religious freedom. If that's, maybe that's even like the one kind of coherent founding value of our nation is that this is always a place where you could come and be a religious freak, and that's great. You know, we won't force you not to be that way. And so I think it is absolutely vital for Christian and Catholic communities and parishes and schools to hold to the Catholic vision of reality and the human person. We, we need to be a place where that truth and that beauty is preserved that we need to be a kind of lighthouse in the culture, like shining that, that light out into the world. And we can't be a bunker, right? So on the one hand, we can't just, just immediately say like, yes, this is awesome, you know, totally affirm anything you wanna be, you know, I'm on board, right? Um, but we also can't be like, oh no, what's wrong with people these days? Like, like the girls look like boys and oh, you know, like, <laughs> gotta go like hide in our bunker and, you know, totally trad out. You know, that's not, that's not uh, a solution either, right? So the truth has to be preserved so that th this thing is going to churn up a lot of people. There are going to be a lot of people who get churned up by this, this ideology and who come out of it pretty destroyed, I think. And also maybe, you know, have, having certain kinds of a physical appearance that is, isn't really going to change. So our, our parishes also need to be places where, you know, gender non-conforming people and, 
you know, people who maybe have once identified as trans or kind of exploring it or have detransitioned, that they're not going to be scrutinized, um, that they're not going to be rejected, that they're not going to be shut out. So I think that is the task for, um, for Christians and, and Catholics, I think. And Catholics are the best prepared to do it because we have a coherent theology of the body and the human person. Like, we have the most resources um, on that front. Um, so, but, you know, Protestant allies, you know, that's great too. You know, you're welcome, welcome aboard. <laughs> pillage, our, pillage our treasury. Um, but I, I do think it's really, I do think it's really important. Um, in fact, I honestly, I don't know, I'm just gonna go on a limb and say this. I could change my mind later. But um, I really think that if America has any hope on this front, it will be because Christians keep their head about this stuff. And, and have the courage to speak about it. What I would love, I would love to hear priests give homilies on, like maybe the next time the you know, Genesis 2 rolls around in the lectionary, to give this beautiful homily about the sacramentality of the sexed body, and then to say, you know, and, you know, and if you're someone who really struggles with this, and you don't feel at home in your body, you know, like come talk to me, come tell me your story, like we want you to be here, and we want to understand you, and walk with you. Like, that would be a wonderful way to talk about it, to present the truth and beauty of the faith, but then also this invitation um, and then and making good on that promise to accompany people as they, as they kind of wander around um, seeking truth. Helen, did you want to say anything else on that? I saw you nodding your head crazily. Did you want to add? I just thought it was. Ab yeah, I thought it was absolutely beautiful what Abigail said. And you know, I'm not someone. I was brought up Catholic, but I'm not someone who still is Catholic. And yet, something that for me, I can find no other word to express the way I feel about my children's bodies and how beautiful those bodies are than the word sacred. Um. So a sort of secular sacredness, I think, is something that um, atheists like myself or people who aren't religious or have different religious traditions and Catholics can come together on. I mean, the, the, just the idea that my child's body was not born perfect. And I would think that if he were ill, I would think it if he had a disability, I would think it if he was, I mean, I, I didn't mind what sex I had, but you know, whether if he was a boy or a girl, the fact is, he was his own unique little self. And if I can borrow a, an incredibly inappropriate word for it from my day job at The Economist, um, we use the word fungible for go goods that are totally interchangeable. So one barrel of oil is as good as another barrel of oil of the same quality, so they're fungible goods. Well, humans are non-fungible goods. Mm. The people that we love are not interchangeable. The people that we meet are unique individuals who were born and will die and we will never see them again in this world. It's, it's just a one-off thing. So I think we've forgotten that in our culture very generally and whether that's because of a move away from religion or whether it's the way that we've become very technological or that we're afraid to say things that some people might not agree with. But yes, this, this idea of the sacred and the beauty of the people that we love and the perfection of them the way they are I think that might be a helpful way to talk to a child, whether your family is religious or not, that they're really lovely the way they are. You've loved them since the second you knew you were expecting them. And then when you met them, you fell in love all over again, you know? Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you very much, Abigail. Gosh, I just, my whole mind has been opened. So by both of you ladies, and this will continue to be a topic I'm interested in, hopefully all of us. <laughs>